Okay, so we're going to look at this problem where we're asked to find the absolute extrema of a function on an interval. So we have a theorem that talks about problems like this. So this is a little quick reminder here. I'm just going to do some abbreviation. The extreme value theorem, EVT, extreme value theorem, says that if I have a continuous function, so I'm just going to write that theorem here. We'll want to check that condition for this function. So if f of x is continuous on a closed and bounded interval, so an interval from a to b, including both those endpoints, then the function f has an absolute maximum and an absolute minimum. on that interval. Okay, so that's just a little restatement of that theorem we've been looking at. So we want to think a little bit about this function. We clearly have a, an interval like this, a closed and bounded interval. Our interval is 1 to 3, so we have this kind of interval here. So we want to think a little bit about our function and think about whether our function is continuous on that interval. So one important thing to think about is that when you have these kinds of exponents, fraction exponents, negative exponents, or trig functions, or anything like that, you might want to make sure you rewrite that in terms of things that are a little bit easier to think about. So I'm going to rewrite this f of x function with that fraction exponent in terms of what it actually means. So a 2 thirds exponent means the cube root of that expression inside there squared. All right, so when I think about whether this function is continuous or not, I would want to think about some issues. One would be domain issues. Uh, if this were a square root, I might have some things to worry about with domain issues, but because we have a cube root, we're okay with that. So domain issues, uh, things inside even index radicals, denominators, logarithms, inverse trig functions. All right, so I'm okay on all of those fronts. And then if I have a piecewise defined function, I would want to make sure the pieces join up. But I don't have any restrictions to the domain here, and I also don't have a piecewise function. So this function is continuous everywhere, and specifically on this interval from 1 to 3. All right, so that extreme value theorem guarantees that I will have both an absolute maximum and an absolute minimum for the function outputs on this interval. All right, so then we want to think about how I might go about finding the absolute maximum and the absolute minimum. So there are two main steps to these problems. So the first thing that you're going to do is find the critical values. So those are going to come from looking at where the derivative is 0 or does not exist on this interval here. Okay, so we're going to look at finding the derivative. I'm going to go back to the original form. It's maybe a little easier to work with with the derivative. And I'm going to need to use product rule here. So f prime of x equals the derivative of the first function will be 1 times the second function plus the first function and then times the derivative of the second function. So 2 thirds times x minus 2 to the negative 1 third. And then a little chain rule times the derivative of what's inside that second function, but that would just be 1. Okay, so there is my derivative, and I need to think about where this derivative is 0 and does not exist. So again, with the fraction exponents and the negative exponents, I maybe want to rewrite that in terms of what that means so I can think about that a little bit easier. All right, so this first term, I don't need to write the 1 out front. Uh, this is cube root of x minus 2 to the quantity squared. All right, and then all of this part that's after the plus is all one term. I don't need to write the 1. 1 times all this stuff, we'll leave it alone. Uh, I have a negative exponent, so I need to remember that that's really a denominator here. I'm going to rewrite this so my numerator will be 2x, and then the denominator would be 3 times the cube root of x minus 2. 3 times the cube root of x minus 2, negative 1 third power. 
Okay, so I need to think about where that derivative is zero and where that derivative does not exist. So let's talk about the does not exist part first. Okay, so in looking at this derivative and thinking about where this derivative might have some trouble existing, the first thing that should catch your attention is that this denominator would be zero when x equals two. So that's a place where this derivative would not exist. That is in our interval that we're interested in here, so that's a relevant point for this problem. Uh, that's a critical point where the derivative does not exist. All right, and then the other points are going to come from, the other critical points are going to come from looking at where the derivative is equal to zero. So we're going to need a little bit of space to work that out. Okay, so I'm going to go over here and I'm going to set that derivative equal to zero and solve for x. Okay, so I will have cube root of x minus 2, the quantity squared, plus 2x over 3 times the cube root of x minus 2, all equal to 0. Okay, so that looks like a lot of awful algebra to deal with here, but we'll just kind of take it one step at a time, and it actually doesn't turn out too bad. So the first thing I might notice is that I have an equation with a denominator, and so I'd probably like to clear the denominator. So I'm going to multiply through, as long as I'm doing this to both sides of the equation, multiply through both sides of the equation by that denominator, 3 times the cube root of x minus 2. And when I multiply that times this expression that I have here, uh, I'll end up with 3 times, and then I'll have the cube root of x minus 2 times the cube root of x minus 2 squared would be the cube root of x minus 2 cubed. The cubed and the cube root will undo each other. Actually, I'll just be left with x minus 2. So that cleans up pretty nice. And then also, when I distribute that denominator to here, uh, what I'm multiplying by will cancel with the denominator. So I'm just left with 2x. And then don't forget the other side of the equation, but since I have 0 here, Whatever I take times 0 is still going to be 0. Okay, so what looked like a pretty awful equation to work with, once you kind of just take it one step at a time, I just worried about clearing the denominators and a lot of other stuff simplified as well. I have a pretty easy equation here to solve. Okay, so uh, we'll just solve this for x. Combine my like terms. Add 6 to both sides of the equation, divide through by 5, and I'll get 6 fifths. Okay, so I have two critical values, x equals 2 and x equals 6 fifths. All right, so one of the main steps in these problems is to find the critical values. The second main step in this problem, then, is to evaluate the original function at the critical values and at the endpoints of the interval. So I'm going to erase this a little bit so that I have some more space to do that, and we'll be plugging these critical values in and the endpoints of the interval. I'm going to save my other critical value over here. Okay, so here I've summarized our critical values. One important thing about those critical values would be making sure that they're actually in the interval that we're interested in. So 2 is between 1 and 3, 6 fifths is 1.2, also between 1 and 3. Okay, so we found our critical values from looking at when the derivative did not exist and is zero. And those are both in our interval. So the second main step then in all of these problems is to evaluate the original function at the critical values. I'll just make a little chart here. x equals 2, x equals 6 fifths are critical values. and also at the endpoints of your interval. Those are the other places where you might have extreme values. Okay, so I'm interested in the outputs or the y coordinates of these points when these are my different x values. So I'm just going to plug each of those into the original function, either way that I have that represented. All right, so I'm just going to put into the original function here. So for x equals 2, I'll have 2 times 2 minus 2 to the 2 thirds. 2 minus 2 is 0. 
to the two-thirds is zero, times two is still zero. Uh, when I put in six-fifths, I'm gonna get some kind of messy uh, expression here. Six-fifths minus two will be negative four-fifths to the two-thirds power. Uh, so that doesn't simplify a whole lot. I could rewrite that as six-fifths times 16 25 to the two-thirds power. We'll probably want a decimal approximation for that at some point, so we'll want to plug that into your calculator at some point. Uh, you should get about 1.03 when you plug that in. This is the actual function output, but the decimal approximation will help us with what we need to look at next. Um, when I put in x equals 1, 1 minus 2 to the two-thirds will be negative 1 to the two-thirds, so negative 1 squared is 1, and then the cube root of 1 is just going to be 1. And then when I put in 3, 3 times 3 minus 2 to the two-thirds, 3 minus 2 is 1, 1 to the two-thirds is 1, times 3 will give us 3. Okay, so I'm evaluating my function at my critical values and at my endpoints, and then what I'm looking for is the highest value, the highest output value, that would be my absolute maximum, and the lowest output value, that would be my absolute minimum on this interval. So I'm looking at these output values, this is where this decimal approximation is useful, so I know whether this number is bigger than one or smaller than one or bigger than three or not. So when I look at these output values, I see that the smallest output value is right here. So that's the absolute minimum. And that occurs at x equals 2. And then the highest output value here is 3. And that is our absolute maximum. And that occurs at x equals 3. All right, a good thing to do after you've done all the calculus work is to look at a graph. So we're going to look at a graph of this function and specifically look at the graph on this interval from 1 to 3. Okay, so here we see a graph of the function, the f of x function that we started with. I've graphed that just on the interval from 1 to 3, and I've got several points labeled here. Our critical points at 6 fifths, we've got a decimal approximation here, so the input is 1.2 or 6 fifths, the output is approximately 1.03. And the other critical value where the derivative does not exist, notice that sharp corner there that would indicate the derivative does not exist, that's at 2, 0. And then the end points of our interval at x equals 1, we had an output value of 1, and at x equals 3, we had an output value of 3. So we can see our lowest point, absolute minimum, is 0, and that occurs at x equals 2. And our highest point, absolute maximum, is 3, and that occurs at x equals 3. Always a good idea to graph it once you've done your calculus work, just to make sure that your numbers make sense. All right, we'll do some other examples in the next video.